the Oklahoma City Thunder beat the San Antonio Spurs as the rotation comes alive for the Oklahoma City Thunder. We'll talk about that and much more on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder Podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your teams every day. I am your host, me member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles. you can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOTHUNDERPOD. Email the show, LOTHUNDERPOD at gmail.com. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder beating the San Antonio Spurs to get back on track and end their homestand. As, o- as SGA drops 28, Jalen Williams turns in a beautiful second half. The moose gets loose and Trey Mann gets back on track. How we found out some more about Mark's rotation and what the future holds on that front. We'll dive into that as well. Thank you so much for making Locked on Thunder your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms so you never miss an episode. Also, subscribe on YouTube as well, which of course is free. We start the way we always do with our game overview. And so for the Thunder, their injury report was Chet Holmgren out, obviously, all season. Jeremiah Robinson Earl out with an ankle injury. I asked Mark for an update on him uh, before the game, and Mark said that he's still a ways away and that he's not even moving like a basketball player yet, so it's still week to week for Jeremiah Robinson Earl. What that impacts for the Thunder, we'll talk about in tomorrow's show. Usman Jang out with that wrist injury uh, will be reevaluated in about four weeks from now, five, four weeks from now uh, for Usman Jang. And then the three G League assignments, Lindy Waters, Eugenio Marui, and Jalen Williams, who had a triple-double in the G League this afternoon. For the Thunder, they start out with SGA, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, J-Dub, and Poku. However, their five minute getters were SGA, J-Dub, Trey Mann, Wiggins, and Josh Giddy. Right out of the gate, Poku got hurt. And it was awful for the Thunder because Poku in that starting lineup, uh, he's he had a really good game uh, last time out and was looking to turn the corner in this December stretch. And he played two minutes, first game after his 21st birthday, he played two minutes, recorded three points, a rebound, and a block in two minutes. Now Mark said that they'll be updating uh, the situation tomorrow. The team has only said it's a left leg injury, so no specifics yet. We'll find out more tomorrow. They're going to travel to Charlotte um, and play the Hornets on Thursday. Uh, it looked bad just sitting there and watching him immediately go to the bench and wave for help just immediately upon going down and, and staying down and having helped, you know, help, getting help off of the court and to the locker room from Jay Will and uh, Omarui. It looked bad, but I'm not a doctor, and I also did not stay at a Holiday Inn last night, so I'm not going to speculate too much, but obviously it was a big blow to the Thunder uh, to lose a guy like Poku and we'll see how long that's going to be for. It could be, you know, that he's back on Thursday. It could be that he's out for whatever extended amount of time that it is. We'll find out from Mark uh, at some point throughout the day on Wednesday, uh, it seems like. But it is a bummer to have his first game after turning 21 be kind of uh, hit with an asterisk like this one that he got hurt. But you, you kind of did see from pregame talking to Mark about the festivities yesterday that uh, he had every player pull plays from uh, Poku's career that they just love, and there were some good plays and some bad plays. And so to have a guy like Poku, who the team really rallies around, who can laugh at himself, who can uh, enjoy the company of his teammates is obviously great. It kind of helps team chemistry, obviously. And Mark said that the uh, rookies are terrible singers, but that Jeremiah Robinson Earl and Darius Baisley are good singers. So credit to them as well. SGA, I mean... What more is there to say about SGA? The the big selling point of this game is his defense. He dropped 28 points tonight. Could have been 30, but the Thunder did not even need him to play in the final three minutes of this game because it was a blowout win for OKC, but he did still see 33 minutes of action in this one. 
had 28 points, eight assists, six rebounds, two steals, four blocks. He leads the NBA in blocks as a guard uh, for the guard position. He leads the NBA in blocks, uh, two steals as well. Uh, him and Oji and Obi are the only two players to record at least a steal or a block in every game that they've played in so far this year, which I find interesting uh, for in terms of like perimeter players. I find that very interesting to see the strides that SGA's made on the defensive end. After the game, he talked about how he takes that defensive end personally, um, was asked if that's kind of an area of focus for him this year. He talked about taking it more personally this year. And he said before how like, uh, he stepped up to the challenge. You know, Mark kind of issued a challenge to him and to Giddy and to Man and, like, and all these players to step up defensively. So far, so good for SGA. Um, and it's not just like a fluke, in my opinion. It's not like, you know, he got lucked into blocks or steals, and, and that's kind of why we think he's a good defender. He has the quickness. He has the um, ability to slide in front of guys and use his length if he gets beat to, you know, switch on to different positions and to play at a high level on the defensive end. So I think that this is very transferable to next season, very transferable to future years, and very transferable to the playoffs whenever the game even slows down and plays in a half-court clip. Offensively, he was still great. 10 for 11 from the free throw line, 64% from the floor, did not take a single three-pointer in this game, which which was obviously kind of uh, noteworthy, but it's not as though he makes his bread and butter at the three-point line anyway. He still got the 28 points. I think what stood out the most offensively, because offensively with SGA, it's kind of just like throwing your hands up and saying, what else is there left to say about his offensive game? What stood out the most this game was the ability to create off the bounce and like truly lose his man off the bounce and truly use his dribble moves and his ball handling ability to shake off a defender and not just go downhill, attack strong, which is great, but it also lose them on the, on the perimeter and get to the second level of the defense. So I thought it was really good from him in this one. And he had tough shots. Like, this was not an easy 28 points. He made it look easy because he shot 64% from the floor. But, like, the Spurs were playing good defense. It it was the kind of defense where you just throw your hands up and say, I mean, if he's going to make that shot, there's nothing you can do about it. You did everything you could short of fouling him. At some point, you did foul him, and it just didn't matter. The the shot still goes in. So you have one of those players that are annoying for other teams to to game plan plan against, and uh, it shows. SGA was incredible. 28 points, 8 assists, 6 rebounds. Josh Giddy had a bit of a wacky game. Like, you look at this in terms of scoring, 7 points on 27% shooting from the floor. Just was not very effective offensively and had a couple of glimpses in this game where he, he's attacking strong and finishing strong at the rim. Uh, but it was mainly about the other things that he did well in this one. So while he got the 7 points and he went one for uh, 1 from 3, it was limiting turnovers. He only had two turnovers in this one. Uh, he got a block and a steal on the defensive end. So you you factor in that block leading to the Thunder being able to get a stop defensively. The steal, obviously, ending a possession. He got seven rebounds to create possessions either by ending uh, Spurs possessions or by regaining the Thunder possession and getting, giving them a second chance with eight assists. And, and these eight assists were get-your-money's-worth assists. Like the the bounce passes, the threading the needle passes, just throwing the basketball with 90-mile-per-hour velocity. Like, if you go back and you go to NBA.com and you just click on the assist category for Josh Giddy, you will enjoy each and every one of these eight assists. None of them are boring. None of them are skip-worthy. Like, these are, like, legit assists that are going to have you salivating when you watch them back. And for Josh Giddy, personal note for him, he becomes the second youngest player in NBA history to uh, reach 1,000 points, 500 rebounds, and 500 assists. He does it at age 20 and 78 days. LeBron James is the youngest player to do it at 19 years old and 326 days. So pretty cool to see your name attached to LeBron James and Josh Giddy in this short career. It's only been 83 games so far. And in 83 games, he's seen his name attached to LeBron attached to Wilt Chamberlain, attached to these all-time greats uh, already, which is is a really cool accomplishment when you get down to it. Coming up, let's talk J-Dub, let's talk Trey Mann, and is this rotation getting flushed out? Why is the lineup exploration still important to this day? We'll talk about all that coming up, but first, I want to tell you right now about our good, good, good friends over at Prize Picks. Price Picks is incredible. Price Picks is 
the best app on my phone right now. Go to prizepicks.com, download the app as well on your app store. And what Price Picks is, it's just a fun way to get more engaged into the game. You pick two to six players each night, and you just pick the over-under on the Prize Picks projections. And if you win, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projected numbers. It's this easy. You go to that game Thursday against the Hornets. And the over-under could be SGA over under 25 points. And then you want to say, oh, he's going to get over that. It's the Hornets. Okay, click the over on that one. You can also take, oh, let's see, Trey Mann over under four and a half points. I'm taking the over on that, obviously. He's in a groove now. Uh, so you take the over on that. And then you sit back, you watch. Does Trey Mann score five? Does does SGA put up you know, 26, 27, 28, 30 points again? And then if they do, you win. And you just continue to, to allow yourself to get more immersed in the game. Prize Picks offers projections on every sport that you watch. I mean, NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, uh, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, you name it. They've got it over there at Prize Picks. You can make these entries in 60 seconds or less. Go there right now to Prize Picks, download the app, or go to the website. You get a 100% deposit match up to $100 at Prize Picks whenever you use the code Locked On. So check them out today. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I want to thank you so much for making Lockdown Thunder your first listen. For your second listen, check out the Lockdown Sports Today podcast. Jalen Williams, he's special. And I've told you before about the all-star potential, and I, I explained it you know, again yesterday. Saying that Jalen Williams has all-star potential is not necessarily saying he's going to make the all-star team, like in, in his career even. It's very hard, especially when you play in a good team. And, and as, as it projects right now, he's going to play in a team with SGA, who's going to be a perennial all-star from this point forward. He's going to play in a team that has Chet Holmgren, who is going to have uh, all-star capabilities from this point forward. He's going to play with himself, of course, who's going to be uh, playing at that all-star level himself. And the Thunder have to be really good to get three-plus all-stars, You know, not to mention Josh Giddey, not to mention whoever you draft in the 2023 draft, like whatever the, whatever the future holds on that front. But in terms of caliber of player, the tier of player, superstar, star, all-star, starter, role player, like at the tier of player, the tier for J-Dub is all-star. He only had two points in the first half. He finishes with 15 points, nine rebounds, three assists, a steal, two blocks. He's diving for loose balls. He's creating possessions. He shot 58% from the floor. Really good defense. The, The block that he had just absolutely erased a shot into the 10th row. Uh, does a great job as a cutter, plays a lot bigger than he is. That's the biggest point of emphasis to me for explaining J-Dub's game. He plays a lot bigger than what he is. He's able to play in that dunker spot, able to play as a cutter, able to play down low as a post score whenever you need him to fill in those gaps at the four. And he, he said after the game, he jokes with everybody that he is a power forward now. And that's crazy considering he's able to have such great playmaking and, and guard abilities and then the Thunder, due to this roster construction, are having him play the four, and he's thriving at it. Like, whenever you have a guy like J-Dub to dump these passes off to, especially whenever the Thunder are so uh, focused on getting to the rim, like, you look at this team. SGA, the the best he's going to be is by attacking downhill. Lou Dort, if he's going to score the ball, you, you know he's going to attack downhill, for better or worse. It's not been great percentage-wise, but he is going to get downhill a lot. Uh, Josh Giddy. He's going to get downhill a lot. Like you, you, All these guys are are prone to getting downhill. Wiggins is going to cut a ton. Uh, Kenny Hustle is going to cut a ton. And so off of those cuts, off of those drives downhill, who's there to bail you out whenever the defense shifts over to you to give you the attention? These little these little shovel passes over to uh, J-Dub to, to dunk it home. And you're seeing him, I think, get more aggressive offensively. Uh, you, you saw him take a lot more shots in the previous game, but in this game, in, the aggression was not necessarily about shot total or, or shooting percentage. He still shot 58% from the floor, a very efficient night, but it was more so aggressive in terms of uh, decisive and in terms of I'm going to go up with this. Nobody's going to stop me. I don't care that the, the defense is right in my face. I'm just going to punch it on you. I'm just going to dunk on you. It does not matter. You know, Getting that edge, playing with that swagger is all the reasons why you need players like J-Dub. J-Dub can make a simple play and his animation, 
his his tenacity gets everyone else going off of a off of a nice you know backdoor cut dunk, right? Because he because he not only dunks it though, now he's screaming. Now he's screaming, you know, towards the fans where the fans are now engaged and they're going to make some noise. And it just it just kind of carries across the arena. It carries across the team. And the next thing you know, now you've pickpocketed somebody you're on a fast break and the rest is history. I mentioned after the game, the reason he dove for the loose ball that set up the Trey Mann uh, finish at the, you know, on the fast break was because Mark showed the team uh, like a montage of them not diving for loose balls. And so J-Dub wanted to avoid the next montage. And just before J-Dub, um, just before J-Dub came in the room and, and came in for his interview, it was Mark's turn, of course, at the podium. He always starts out uh, as coaches do. And he said that it was a hell of a play to make that diving, um, kind of the diving loose ball kick out to the Trey Man, which just kind of taps it and rolls it across the floor to Trey Man for an easy bucket. And, and, and he mentioned how that was kind of the turning point in the game and how that kind of was the the straw that broke the camel's back, so to say, for this contest. And so obviously that's something that Mark is exclaiming to these guys that this stuff matters. When you do little things like that, when you when you dive for loose balls, when you get tie-ups, whenever you chase down long rebounds, whenever you create possessions, it breaks the back of your opponent. It gives you the edge to win basketball games. And you're seeing that come through with how every player, Star status doesn't matter. Experience status does not matter. What you've done to that point in the game doesn't matter. Every player is getting on the floor. Every player is getting those floor burns and trying to create these possessions. You saw Giddy create possessions. You saw Jadab create possessions. You saw Kenny Hustle create possessions. You saw Isaiah Joe create possessions. Like every player is doing what it takes to make up for their lack of size and to, you know, kind of swing things back to the Thunder side, and it's why they have a top 10 defense. Uh, I believe it's at ninth right now uh, defensively for the Thunder, even without Chet Holmgren, who is arguably their best defender, uh, even without Chet Holmgren, and even with obvious disadvantages on paper for this roster construction. And so Jadab's a big part of that. Uh, Trey Mann, really liked this game. Like I think that he really found it in this one. 28 minutes, 17 points, three assists, a rebound, a steal, three for six shooting from three. And it could have been even better than three for six because he had one step back three that just looked so online, looked so beautiful, but it just, just softly rimmed out and it could have easily uh, went home. It was halfway down and then bounced out. Shot 45% on the floor. I thought he played better defense, um, honestly, in, in this one than he typically typically does. Uh, I talked to Cameron Woods after the blue game about you know, Trey Mann and about uh, assignments and the big thing that the Thunder were looking for whenever they sent Trey Mann down to the blue was for him to play with a more competitive spirit, uh, but also the things that you already know, right? So you already know about trying to find his rhythm as a shooter, trying to get him uh, catching the shoot opportunities. But I think that what kind of got lost was Cam, Cam Woods explaining, you know, that they wanted to see him play competitive basketball and play with that competitive fire. And he did that in the G League. He got all showcase honors, scored 35 points in the first game and 40 points in the second game, and then had to play a third straight game in as many nights. And so that takes a lot of uh, fire, obviously, to do that in, in an NBA setting. And then he came back, and this one uh, was really intense defensively for his standards, uh, something that we saw him start to do in the preseason, but uh, kind of faded a little bit uh, throughout the rest of the season. Uh, and then offensively, the shots went in this time, and he was able to compile uh, some nice stats. We'll talk Muscala, Joe, Kenny Hustle, Aaron Wiggins, and if the Thunder should continue their lineup exploration coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, but good friends over at Bet Online, folks, you could have bet on this game and won some money. The Thunder were minus seven and a half in this contest to beat the Spurs. They covered and they were able to get the win both on the scoreboard and against the, against the spread. Uh, so you could have put your money where your mouth is at Bet Online and won some money. Bet Online, though, not only has spreads, they have prop bets, they have lines, they have odds. You can bet on who Trey Young's next team is going to be. You can bet on who James Harden's next team is going to be. You can even bet on who the next NBA coach to be fired is uh, over there at Bet Online. Uh, for example, Trey Young, next team, if not Atlanta Hawks, the favorite in the clubhouse, the Dallas Mavericks. How would that even work? I don't know, but Vegas thinks it would. Uh, and I don't even know how the trade package comes about. The favorite to be the next coach fired is Dwayne Casey uh, at three, uh, three to one, and then the second is Steve Clifford. Uh, that seems pretty uh, spot on there with those odds and those lines. But check it all out at Bet Online. 
but online is where the game starts. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Let's continue on. We've talked about a lot of different guys, but Mike Muscala deserves one of the biggest hat tips of the night. He had a season-high 19 points, six rebounds, two assists, a steal, a block, three for five from three, did not miss a shot inside the arc, walled up at the rim very well. And I don't think that it, it it's kind of given enough credit because I don't think that we'll actually know for sure. Like, obviously, the, the kind of coach speak answer would be, oh, all of our guys have to be ready to play no matter what. But did Muscala actually plan to play this many minutes? Did he actually plan to get into the game two minutes into the contest if he did plan to play? Like, even if he planned to play in general and and, and plan on not getting a DMP CD, did he plan to go into the games two minutes into it? Did he plan to play 21 minutes? Probably not. Like, in all honesty, he probably didn't plan to do any of this. And then he just was on though, hitting mobile threes, getting you 19 points, getting you that interior defense that you, that you need in drop coverage, six rebounds, two assists, a steal, a block, really good game from Mike Muscala. Uh, it was really funny after the game. He told a story that uh, ironically enough, before this specific game, Chet Holmgren bet Muscala a million dollars that he could not outscore Shea. And Shea had 28, Muscala had 19. And if the Thunder could have put the Spurs away in that third quarter, and just kind of buried him then instead of waiting around until, you know, the, the around the five minute mark, uh, six minute mark of, of the fourth. Like maybe Muscala does outscore Shea and Holmgren's pocketbook is about a million dollars lighter. Uh, but nonetheless, Muscala was great post game. Uh, I asked him a question about Shea, which we're going to get into tomorrow. But Muscala deserves a big round of applause for the way that he played in this one. Isaiah Joe. Stat line is not going to pop out to you, but one for two from three, obviously good for, as, as a shooter, 50%, uh, but did not need to take a lot. Also had a nice jelly layup finish off of a steal, which is two steals defensively, a rebound, six points. And it, regardless of the steal number, which is obviously good, it's good to get two steals. I thought that this was independently the best defense that you saw him play as a member of the Thunder. Like he really stayed attached at the hip. Like I, I cannot wait to re- watch this game tomorrow. I, I always do. Um, a rewatch every afternoon. And I think that Gallo was on the call today, uh, which Nick Gallo, MVP of the game, he, he called play play for the blue. And I think that you guys t- tweeted at me that he had to call play play for the thunder as well. I cannot wait to re- rewatch that tomorrow, uh, but he had to do two play plays. If that's the case in one day, that is thoroughly impressive. But for Isaiah Joe, um, he really stayed attached to his man. Like go back and watch Joe's defensive possessions and you will not see but an inch of separation between him and his assignment and at any given time in man and man defense. Like Joe played really well and was aggressive on that end. And the Thunder caused some chaos at the end of these quarters where they sent traps and were able to fluster these young Spurs. Now, Kenny Hustle stayed steady as they come, uh, got a chase down rebound, uh, which was five rebounds for him, uh, seven points, one for th- uh, one from three, and just played that hard defense. Wiggins, 12 points, six rebounds, a steal. 55% shooting, great as a cutter. Uh, and, and I got the question asked, should the Thunder continue this lineup exploration? My answer is yes, because you need as much data as possible. You need to know um, where this team stands. You need to know uh, which players you can depend on and which players work together and don't work together for next season because next season is very pivotal. Like I know that this team is very young. I know that this team feels like they have all the time in the world. But next season, you're going to try to work in three guys into your rotation. The rotation's already at 10, 11 names deep of guys who you think deserve minutes, of guys who if you pulled 100 Thunder fans um, family feud style and said who deserves to play the most minutes, like you would get 10, 11, 12 answers of of people uh, polling and ranking these names in different orders of who deserves the most minutes. Then you're going to add three more on top of that. There's just simply not enough minutes to go around. And so I think that it is very important to do the lineup exploration now um, in this season to figure that out before you you know attempt to work in three more guys next year. We're going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow as well. So stay tuned for that. So tomorrow will be a jam-packed show. Uh, and NBA standings watch, the Thunder, a game and a half out of the play-in. The Hornets could not pull off the comeback and beat the Warriors. So they're still a game and a half back of the play-in. Uh, this is the... Uh, point of the season where the Thunder are eight games back of the worst record in the NBA. So like they would have to go on quite the skid to be the worst record. They're eight games back of that. 
They are four games back of the Spurs for the fourth record, uh, first fourth worst record, which is where they had finished the last two years. And then they are five games back of the Rockets for a bottom three record, and it's only a game and a half back of the play-in tournament. So we'll see where this all shakes out, but that's kind of the standings update for now. The Thunder grew a 20-point lead. The Spurs never saw their lead go past four. There were four lead changes, three times tied, OKC won 130 to 114. The Thunder got four more rebounds. They had two fewer turnovers. The Thunder only had 12 turnovers, and they won points off the uh, turnovers, uh, points off turnovers 22 to 20. The Thunder also won fast break points, which I think is a huge deal for this team that wants to play with space and wants to play with pace and wants to uh, run with these young guys. Uh, also, the Thunder won points in the paint battle, 64-62. The Spurs, though, where they made their bread and butter were two areas. The Spurs dominated second chance points. They won the second chance points, points category 31 to 16. The Spurs also were hitting incredibly tough shots. Like there were multiple times where Vassell, Johnson, you know, uh, Sohan, there were multiple times where they were just hitting these, these bonkers shots that you just, you just shrug your shoulders at and you can't even get upset that they're, that they're making them or that the Thunder are playing bad defense or anything. It's just, it's just one of those nights for them. Uh, and so the tough shot making ability and the second chance points were what kept the Spurs in this game for so long. And then eventually they faded, of course, in the fourth quarter. Uh, OKC shot 53, 54, 80. The Spurs shot 46, 34, 85. The Spurs had six in double figures. The Thunder had five in double figures, but nine with seven or more points. Jeremy Sohan was awesome. 16 points, nine rebounds, four assists, a steal, two blocks. Devin Vassell dropped 20 points, uh, three and two with a steal. And then Popovich got ejected uh, fairly early on in this game, and it was a fairly quick uh, hook for Pop. I don't know what he said, but it must have been egregious because it was a fairly quick hook for Popovich. Like I said before, the Thunder covered the seven-point spread. MVP of this game, let's go to Jalen Williams. I mean, that second half was monstrous for him. Uh, up next on the show, Thursday, we're going to update you on JRE. We're going to talk about J. Will's triple-double. We're going to talk about lineup exploration and give you our New Year's resolutions for the Thunder members of this team on Friday. We're going to recap that Hornets game, and then Saturday is the New Year's Eve special uh, where the Thunder take on the... 76ers and continue on with their New Year's Eve tradition of playing in the Paycom Center. So go out to that one as well. Follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore styles. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.